closer than a brother. There is no judgment. Oh, how he loves me. I've got a friend, and he is my strength. He is my portion. With me in the valley, with me in the fire, with me in the storm. But all my life, testify, hallelujah, we are not alone. God When I am tempted to question that God really loves us, I am uh, reminded of all the relationships that I'm blessed to have here at Milligan and especially with Christian brothers and sisters. This is my friend Callie. Welcome Callie this morning. Give her a hand. We're talking about mentors today. and. Uh, Callie's work-study job brings her close to my office, and that's how we've become friends. And so earlier this week, we, we had a conversation about, uh, about the privilege that she has to have a mentor, and a, a Christian mentor. So I'd like for Callie just to share a little bit about that. Callie, 
um, how did you come to uh, how did you come to have a mentor relationship uh, with this with this woman? So my mentor was our worship leader at my old church. It was her wife. I mean, wait. <laughs> the worship leader was her husband, and I was involved in the worship team, um, and just really got to know her through all the time that I spent with the worship team and with his family and all of her kids. She has three boys. And so I just really got to know her through a lot of those interactions. What kind of conversations have, have deepened this mentor relationship that she, that she shares with you? Um, so at the church at the time that I met her through, um, we went through a lot of transitions and church hurt and just different trials through life. Um, and so through those, I didn't really know, I didn't really have anyone to lean on. Um, and so I really just leaned into her and she helped me like lean into God through that. Um, and so we had a lot of really hard conversations, but what I really appreciate about her is through those hard conversations, she also was hard on me um, and really pushed me to, be better, um, and yeah. And how do you continue to benefit from this relationship? Still having hard conversations. Um, college is hard. Life is hard. Um, and so I still, I'll just call her, like, even if it's, like, 3 a.m., I'll be like, hey, I need to scream. And she's like, okay. So then she just lets me scream. Um, but then at the end of it, she's like, that was kind of stupid. Let's let's talk about that. And so she'll like pull me back into reality and like sometimes it's okay for her to look at me and go, that was dumb. You should probably not do that again. Um, so yeah. Thank you, Callie. Uh, you know, a local church is one of the places where you might find a mentor. There are potential mentors all around this campus and we just want you to be thinking about that today. Callie, thanks for coming and sharing with us today. Well, hey, friends. One person got it. Hey, well, my name's Joel. Uh, I'm a senior here. I'm volleyball, uh, track and field. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce my friend Greg Grant. Uh, he is a student pastor at the Edgewood campus at uh, Mountain Christian Church in Joppa, Maryland. Um, and he was actually one of my mentors slash leaders when I was a student uh, in high school. Um, I'm not going to tell an embarrassing story because I don't want to. But um, it was really fun. Uh, I got to work at CIY Move uh, alongside him uh, this past summer. And just being able to work beside uh, my mentor and some of my leaders um, was just really cup filling. Um, and then also another little shameless plug. We also have, uh, if you're interested in semester and ministry, they are doing a uh, semester and ministry kind of like rundown in the sub seven uh, after chapel today. Um, and some of our friends from Mountain will be there. Um, so if you're interested in semester in ministry, go check it out. It's really awesome. I love that church. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Greg. And let's give him a warm welcome. Well, hey, everyone. How's it going? Give me one second here. Um, I am just super glad to be here, and um, first I wanted to pause and say thank you to teachers and administrators and you all for being so welcoming and hospitable as we've made the drive down from Maryland to join you all. You guys really know how to make a guest feel welcome. And speaking of guests, um, whenever there's a guest speaker that comes back to Maryland for us, um, something that I've noticed is that unprompted, they show pictures of their family as if they came together and like decided they're going to do that ahead of time. So I'm going to step into that long tradition here and show you pictures of my family. Um, these are pictures of my family from our wedding. Emily and I got married in December of 2020. And so um, we were surrounded by so many people that day that poured into us, that have shaped and formed us into the people that stepped up to the altar um, on December 19th, 2020. And so one of those people 
um, that means a whole bunch to me is this guy. You're going to get to see him in a moment. Here he is. It's coming soon. <laughs> oh, that's my, uh, my grandfather and his wife-in-law. Um, and then that's Aaron Schwab there. That's my wife and um, her parents, Greg and Amy. And then that's my mom hugging her on that day. Um, and so, yeah, a whole bunch of people that have meant a whole bunch to us. Um, <laughs> the... <laughs> The Bunny Years Behind is the classic. You guys have probably done that before. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a video of uh, my mentor that I'd like to show you um, and introduce you to him. So if you guys have that, um, that would be awesome because he's, he's really great and you're going to see this. How does a middle-aged Midwest white boy with a Bieber haircut but no Bieber talent dignify a remix of a story so eloquently told? Over 20,000 words of gold. Lin Manuel, that brother, cold. <laughs> so, uh, whether <laughs> so, whatever you think of his bars or lack thereof, right? Um, Luke Erickson has meant a lot to me, and through a lot of different conversations, both difficult and um, challenging and building up, um, Luke has really poured into me, and um, he's the reason that I'm here with you all today. He's called me into vocational ministry. He's prayed for me and my family in difficult times, and so what I want you guys to see is that um, there's a lot of fruit in the fact that um, someone of, of Luke's background took time to talk and to shape and form me. And really what we call that relationship is a mentorship relationship. Now, when I say mentorship, some of you guys are like, that's really stuffy and it sounds boring. You probably think of some positive things. But what I want to talk to you guys about is whether or not um, you have a positive association with mentorship or a negative association with it. Um, today, what we're not going to do is we're not going to dive into the mechanics of how a mentorship relationship works. What we're going to do is talk about the necessary foundation that a mentorship relationship grows from. And really, the foundation of a mentorship relationship um, comes from the fact that it's, it's a simple fact, um, very profound yet simple, and it's just this simple fact. Jesus rose from the dead. It's what brought everyone from our family together um, on that wedding day, all of our close friends, our small group. And really, Jesus of Nazareth, our anointed representative, uh, exhausted the power of sin and death and took its consequences on our behalf and then rose from the grave and is now seated above every power, ruler, and authority. And for over two millennia, the proclamation of that message is the only thing strong enough to bring warring tribes together and make them brothers different ethnic groups from different cultural customs and backgrounds and bring them together. Different people of different age ranges that really have nothing in common and make them a family brought together by the blood of Jesus. And so really that's the foundation from which all relationship, mentorship relationships come from. And it's also that proclamation has people thinking about it radically reorients relationships in general. And the people of the early Jesus movement were wrestling with um, what it means for people that were once uh, alienated to be brought together into this new family of God. And um, John's letter, in um, first letter of three in the New Testament, um, is one of those. And he was writing to a network of house churches in modern day Ephesus. And he was trying to glean wisdom from the Spirit on what it looks like for um, a relationship of different people from different backgrounds to be able to come together. So if you have your Bibles, turn to that text that was read in the beginning, 1 John 
um, chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. We're going to get there, but first we're going to take a little survey of the book of 1 John or the letter of 1 John. So John is writing to, as I said, this network of house churches in what is now modern-day Turkey. And he was saying to them, or um, not only were they ethnically diverse, but they were um, ideologically diverse. And the two poles of the ideological spectrum, one that was represented was called docetism, and that was a part of the early Christian period where people thought that Christ only seemed to come in the flesh. He didn't actually come and, and incarnate. And so on the other hand, what we had were elitist Judaizers, and those were people that were like, yo, this is a messianic movement. You know, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the, the, the Jewish Messiah. Well, all y'all Gentiles are coming in. Y'all have to study Torah, right? You have to practice Torah to be saved, right? And so John's stepping into this, and he's in the first four verses addressing that divide. And he's saying, no, 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 no. Here's how I address these polls, right? One of them could be seen as um, ideological... Um, like de skeptical deconstructionism, and the other one could be uh, religious, uh, dogmatic, like certain fundamentalism. And those two poles don't really mix well together as we're seeing in our current times. And so John says to them, the, the, the way that you bridge that gap, the way that you bring people together that are, that are on different sides in an ideological divide is through wisdom. It's through experience. John is saying he's experienced, he's heard, he's seen the risen Christ, and that's transformed his relationships. And if you all come in and experience that with me, your relationships will be full as well. And then from verse 5 all the way to chapter 2, verse 11, John starts talking about, well, if I've experienced the Lord, if I've experienced him in the person of Jesus, then what is he like? And he starts to launch into a couple of themes, and one of them is that God is light. And so John starts talking about this, and he says that God is light, and basically what he's summing it up to say is that if God is light and we've experienced him, then we don't live our lives um, intentionally seeking darkness. But if we do fall into darkness, he is always faithful and just to forgive us in the person of Jesus, who is our advocate as we follow him. And that brings us all the way to our teaching text. So you guys have gotten there. Um, if you guys notice in your Bibles, it's probably uh, set out like a poem, and it's probably set in those lines. And it's important to notice that because when John wrote this, it's very much a symmetrical passage, right? And it's written so that those that heard it would be able to memorize it and take it away with them. Because this is, the, this is a climactic point in the letter. This is something that John wanted his followers to understand. The other thing that you'll notice is that it says because a lot. Because your sins have been forgiven. Because, because, because. And that's called a hati clause in Greek. And when you see that, the Bible is clear on a lot of things. But the Bible's not so clear on some things. So when you see the Bible give you a because or a therefore or so that, bring out your highlighter or your pen because the author is trying to give you wisdom on God and who he is so that it can enrich your life and your walk with him. The other thing I want you guys to notice is that every single verb in that uh, passage is written from a state of aspect. So it's talking about a state of affairs that has taken place because of a past event. So there was an event that happened that caused all of these relationships to come together. And it's also the fact that those relationships are now brought together and it's continuing into the present time as the author was speaking. And so what I want you guys to see in this passage is that there's uh, several different ranges of people that are mentioned. And within that, um, there are fathers, children, and young men, right? And so what I want to talk about is the fact that there's really three and then a bracket that surrounds the rest of those that are being addressed. 
And so the first of those are fathers, and they're told different things, right? And they're, they're told something. Children, uh, as you can guess, by the way, these are not like allegorical, like, you know, you're a father in the faith, like you're more wise. This is literally like we're talking about age and, and, um, and those kinds of things here. So fathers, and then we hear from children. Um, the message to children are kids that are uh, middle school, high school, or college age. Um, from, from study, that's where um, John is addressing. And then young men are infants to what you would find in a kid's ministry in modern days. And so here's the important thing. All of them receive a different message. If you guys see that in your Bibles, they all receive something different. John is speaking to them each um, as a group because they have different life phases, different life experiences. But everyone is hearing the things that they're being told because they're all sitting under the reading of the letter by the letter carrier. So notice how there are a bunch of different age ranges but they all participate in hearing the same set of wisdom. And the only way that that happens, the only way that that's brought together is through verse 12. So read with me verse 12. It says in verse 12, I am writing to you, little ch children, since your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Now, Little children, the only other time that that word is used is in chapter 2, verse 1, in the very beginning of that same chapter. And John also uses it in his gospel to, um, when he's accounting Jesus talking to his disciples. So this is not a group of an age range. This is a group that's talking about the children or the family of God. And that really encompasses or brackets the other groups. And notice what he says to this group. Notice what he says. He says, your, since your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Now, there's a lot that could be said about the name. Um, but really what I want to be able to dive into here is that a name in the ancient Near East was used to effectualize something. It was used to bring uh, borders into existence. It was made to represent a king or a deity. It was there to let people know that some reality that was once in our imagination has now come to pass through a person or through a spiritual being. And so what we're talking about is that something has come into our lives, something has entered into our physical existence that once wasn't there. And what was that? It was the forgiveness of sins. And why is it important that it is in Jesus' name? That's the his that we're talking about. Why is that important? It's because in our own name, we were lost. We walked around and wandered in darkness without any help, any help for any kind of direction. We were once isolated, set apart from one another, and we needed desperately light to break into that darkness, to bring us into relationships that are fruitful and bring us hope. And in our own names, we stood condemned in front of a righteous and just God. But now Jesus' name has been given to you. And what I want you all to know is this. Your mentorship goals, as we're talking about this series called Squad Goals, your mentorship goals are only possible through Jesus' name. Because his name has been given to you. Now, everyone in here has the opportunity to take that on to themselves and then be grafted into a family that spans over 2,000 years of brothers and sisters that have heard different things in their walk with the Lord, but have been united by the central theme and fact that the gospel is still moving. And you guys have the opportunity to be a part of that today. That's the foundation of your mentorship goals. And so what I want to do is I want to pause for a second and I want to let you guys think about someone or if you have a notebook or a journal, I want you guys to write down three names in your life 
that um, when, you, when you think of them and you think of where they've been on the journey with Jesus, they inspire you, they bring you, um, they bring you a certain sense of, um, you know, awe and wonder. You're like, oh, I wonder how, you know, they are living their lives that way. And we're going to pause there and give you that time to be able to do that. So think of three or two or three names and then we'll, we'll circle back here. Um, so if that exercise was a little bit difficult for you, I completely understand. Um, and so I, I want to bring some wisdom from church history to help if that exercise was a little bit difficult. Um, there was someone named St. John of the Cross. He was a 16th century um, Carmelite monk, and he wrote a book called The Dark Night of the Soul. And in it, he kind of took the categories that John the Apostle talked about, and he kind of flexed it a bit and made it more about stages of maturity. And he called the different stages a beginner, proficient, and perfect. Don't really like the categories that much and the names of them, but they really help us understand that there are different spectrums and there are different things that people are, heard, are hearing. And in it, he talks about this thing called spiritual friendship. And it helps us discern how to find a mentor in this um, setting where he's talking about spiritual friendship. And here's the quote that he says, we may know it to be so, or we may know that it's a spiritual friendship or it's a mentorship relationship by observing the remembrance of that affection um, that increases our recollection of God or brings remorse of conscience. So basically what he's saying is this, if you think of the person that you wrote down or the person that you kept in your mind's eye, if that person brings you closer to the Lord, that's a person that you should possibly pursue a mentorship relationship with. If that person um, pulls you away and it, it brings you only to like, like, oh, I like the way that this person dresses or I like this person's career path or how much money this person makes or their status, that might not be the relationship that you're trying to foster in, in this scenario. He goes on to say, when this affection is purely spiritual, the love of God grows within it. And the more we think of it, the more we think of God and the greater our longing for him. For the one grows with the other. The spirit of God has this property, property that it increases good by good because there is a likeness and a conformity between them. But when this affection springs out of the vice of sensuality, it affects, its effects are quite the opposite. For the more it grows, the more is the love of God diminished and the remembrance of him also. So again, what I want to encourage you guys is to think of who those people might be. And if you're struggling to find those people, I'm here with Mountain Christian Church and we're doing the semesters in ministry uh, trip here. And there's a bunch of people back home in Maryland that would love to pour into you and to help you to see um, the unique ways in which God has wired you and equip you for gospel-centered ministry. And so we're going to be hanging out um, in the, uh, the lunch center. There's going to be free lunch there. We'd love to get to hang out with you and talk to you more about what the Semesters in Ministry program is about. But I, I really appreciate you guys sharing this time together, and I'd like to pray to close us. So let's go ahead and bow our heads. God, you are so good, and your steadfast love endures forever. And it's brought together so many people, tax collectors and zealots, people from different backgrounds that would have had nothing to do with each other. And that is the very bedrock of any relationship, let alone a mentorship one. 
And God, you are the guide. You are the guide in and through the person of Jesus. And you've led so many to deep, deep waters. And Lord, we just pray that you would be able to um, let students see that mentorship, mentorship relationships are positive and life-affirming and giving. And I pray, Lord, that for those that are um, older, that they would take time to invest in a younger person and let them know how much you love them. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And so in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship. dismissed.